Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everyone. I am Ariel, a grateful member of Al-Anon. Thank you for, sh- Thank you for showing up today. Thanks also to our Al-Anon co-chairs, Vanessa and Dan, for all of your good service this year to make this conference such a success. I was the Al-Anon co-chair last year with Bob M., and what a tremendous experience that was for both of us in our recovery. Um, And special thanks also to the Living Sober Advisory Board and committees for hosting another year of Living Sober. How incredible to become part of this legacy of queer recovery. I am honored to be here and be counted among you. I understand that the chosen theme of this year's conference is living in the now, which as a child of addicted and codependent parents, I had no concept of before I became a member of Al-Anon. Now was not a state of time or a reference that was even available to me. Growing up, we had future tense and past tense. My parents can skillfully recite every single offense ever done to them since the beginning of their childhood. Their list of resentments is long and deep. The past tense was about how the world had done them wrong and how they were here in their addictions deserving of better. Uh, Then there was the future, the shiny, happy, mythological place that never arrived. I got really good at storytelling when I was small. I can make up a scene from almost anything, and the now, the present, the here, was never a location for any of my plot lines. Now, I have moved into my present life. The rooms of my life are filled with unopened boxes from my past, and the remains that were once so important are not quite as urgent as I once believed them to be. I look at pictures of myself from then, and I actually look older, tense and melancholy, dressed in goth punk girl clothes, too much black eyeliner, ragged hair, haunting graveyards like I was already dead, and constantly in mourning over a childhood I didn't get with a family I didn't have. Uh, But this was their legacy, to live in rooms full of promise that to the outside world were full of treasures and prized possessions. But to this little girl, they were cold, and it resembled a mausoleum. Dreaming myself forwards and backwards in time, I grew to hate the present because it showed everyone in a very cruel light. The world was not meant to be viewed with a cruel, sober lens called reality. Dreams and regrets were the building blocks of my world. I walked into the rooms of recovery 11 years ago, blisteringly white, cold, austere, and I saw what the present meant. It meant I could no longer hide behind and amongst my stories. I had to step into the light and become present. Be here now. I found Al-Anon. It was a lover who got me into the rooms. Isn't that true for many of us? Uh, This was before I became, uh, came out as a dyke, before I had self-esteem and confidence to be who I am. The person who I met was also in recovery. He had 14 years or so in AA. And after a few dates, he asked me, "Uh, have you ever heard of this program called Al-Anon? I said, no. Wasn't that something that Christians do? As I knew that many meetings took place in churches, uh, I assumed it was just for Christians only. Growing up in a conservative, orthodox Jewish household, anything that Christians did, we definitely did not do. Uh, So he suggested that I go to an Al-Anon meeting and check it out. I went because his friends were all in AA, 
and I wanted to learn their secret. I wanted to know the language, wanted to fit in, belong, and understand the slogans, the steps, and what it meant to be in recovery. I got to that first meeting and blinded by that stark reality called now, I cried. I could barely speak my name. All I could do was cry and listen like a sponge. I went to meetings all over the place for the first few years because I was living on the peninsula and then Marin and San Francisco, eventually Oakland. But every meeting was the same, hard, heartfelt, humbling, and honest. Each meeting commanded only one thing, be here now. That was one thing I just couldn't grasp. I kept waiting and waiting for that perfect moment to arrive when the steps would coalesce and I would find this priceless gift of serenity. It didn't happen. Well, not like that. Other things happened, though. I found my spiritual path. I found my center. I found community. I found my identity and my voice. When I had to come out as a dyke again to my family, I didn't bother to wait for their acceptance this time or allow it to crush me when it didn't happen. I just kept going. That was one of the things I was learning in the rooms. Keep working the steps, keep turning it over, keep coming back. All you have to do is show up. The thing about recovery that I've learned is that it doesn't stop ever. Once you let it in, it never stops working in all areas of my life and in all of my relationships. In May, I got an email from an estranged cousin on Facebook telling me that my cousin Gloria had passed away from stage four cancer. Gloria was like Princess Di and Barbara Walters rolled into one glamorous busybody, driving expensive vehicles and deriving much pleasure in dealing with other secrets. Uh, Gloria was my mom's best friend beginning in high school, though despite their lifelong rivalry to acquire more stuff. My mom introduced Gloria to her cousin Len, and from then on, they were together. But now, Gloria was dead, and her legacy was left in the hands of her children and the extended family. I was never fond of Gloria. She was very dismissive and disdainful of me. She shamed me and made fun of my goth uniform, Doc Martens and a black motorcycle jacket. Uh, now she was gone and my parents were also gone, uh, celebrating their 50th anniversary overseas. It fell to me, would I go? My parents offered to pay for my tickets back east, and I declined because, hey, um, I'm fully self-supporting thanks to the program. I have financial recovery and sobriety around money. I was going back to the house where the crimes happen where my childhood got squashed, where the now didn't exist. I hadn't been home in eight years, and now I was not only going back, but I'd have to spend the night by myself in an empty house full of ghosts. It turns out my brother was also tapped to return home. My brother, who hasn't spoken to me in four years since he moved away from the Bay Area, and didn't say goodbye. My brother, who also married an addict and is now a father to one too, he too was coming back to the family homestead with his new girlfriend, who would also be attending the funeral. This situation could have been a movie, but it wasn't. It was my life happening right here, right now. Are you kidding me? <laughs> No, I'm not. So off I went to Philadelphia on a red-eye flight, uh, arriving in the mid-morning rush hour to battle traffic along the main line, the scenes of my past streaking past the windows in the Philly humidity. I drove up the driveway 
to the house, and I laughed when I found the key to the front door in the fake stone by the door where it always had been. Nothing had changed except me. I wandered the rooms, touching everything, feeling the weight and structure of the past, and seeing it for the first time as if I had never lived there. It was just a house, a container that once held this family full of dysfunction and disease. Now it was just a container, void of meaning and merit. I found out that my serenity now is not troubled by that past. The hive mind of collected wisdom of 11 years of sitting in rooms came with me through the front door. I had come prepared for battle, ready to grapple anything the past felt important to bring forward. But laying there in my bedroom that I'd spent 18 years in, treasured by junk from birth to graduation, didn't matter. None of it had any power over me. I slept better that night than I had in the previous nights leading up to the trip. The next day, my brother and his girlfriend arrived. Because I had a rental car, I went to pick them up from the airport, and I barely recognized him. The new girlfriend was sweet, much kinder than his ex, and we chatted over dinner candidly, easily, looking back, acknowledging the past, uh, giving voice to the pain. And then we got caught up to now and unified our family before heading to the funeral the next day. We have a renewed relationship, but some of this relationship cannot ever be retrieved, lost forever as time moves forward. But seeing his face ease and warm in that discussion felt so good. The morning of the funeral, I found my way to an Al-Anon meeting in a town where the girls had been so cruel, called me terrible names and made fun of my having a crush on Nancy McKeon from The Facts of Life. It, it didn't matter though. I needed that meeting more than I needed those hurt memories. So I pushed my way through the church doors and found a women's meeting. Thankfully, I didn't see anyone I knew but I did recognize that welcome. That's all it takes most days now, just a simple reminder, the Al-Anon welcome, serenity prayer, even the seventh tradition. One item is all I need to pull myself into focus, into the now. I forgot about the traffic, the funeral, the eyeballs that would observe and critique me, the haunted house of childhood, all that mattered was listening to the woman that morning. It didn't even matter what her share actually contained. What mattered was her courage to be there and ex share her experience, strength, and hope. My experience with the program has shown me that many folks get caught in the folds and nuances of the words and the steps, traditions, and concepts. But word by word, this does not work for me. What works is folding these ideas, these suggestions into my life. The spirit of the program to me is about living in the now, not in the past tense, not future tripping. Being a fundamentalist about brittle or strict adherence to exact words and formulas doesn't work for me because it diverts my focus away from the actual message of the words. I need those specifics for guideposts, but my serenity is not found in the actual text. It is by incorporating and weaving these principles into my life, the funeral. If you combine the set of Dallas with the set of Fiddler on the Roof <laughs> in North Philadelphia, you have an idea. If you can't picture that, I'll describe it for you. It used to be a Jewish neighborhood full of synagogues and kosher butchers, men in 18 layers of garments walking up and down the sidewalk, 
Most people speaking Yiddish, some Russian, some Hebrew, some German, some English, but all with a distinct Philly dialect. Just drop the A off Atlantic Ocean and you'll know what I'm talking about. Or visit the Cherry Hill Mall. Now though, driving up Roosevelt Boulevard, I saw vaporizer stores, people hanging on broken stoops and low riders with tinted windows cruising slowly down the block. But still there in the middle of everything, surrounded by check cashing and convenience stores and used car lots, stood the Jewish funeral home. Oy vey, if my parents could see this, they'd plots. <sighs> I entered the sanctuary on my own just a few minutes before the thing was starting. This is another handy habit I picked up from Al Anon. Being on time matters. It is respectful and meaningful to be on time. This from the girl who is uh, perpetually late. I walked in and heads swiveled in the silence. There in the pews, looking at me and surveying every single hair on my head down to the shine of my high heel boots was my extended family. People I had not seen in five, 10, maybe even 20 years were there blinking at me. No one had seen me since I had come out again, since the divorce, since the dozen other secrets and pieces of gossip they'd gather about me over the years. I just kept my head steady and moved forward up the aisle to the receiving line to greet Gloria's son, daughter, and husband, Len. They all thanked me so much for coming and wished my parents could be there instead. I smiled and bit my tongue. Now was not the time nor the place. If this had happened 11 years ago, I would have stood there and mouthed off because that's what I used to do before the program. I had to make sure every wrong was righted, every injustice called out, and be the person to judge everyone right and wrong. This morning, though, all I had to do was show up and stay present. Be here now. I could not control their comments, their stares, their judgmental gaze. I can only control myself and my response to them in that moment. As I sat in the pew next to my brother, we smiled at each other knowing the full weight of people's commentaries happening around us. I whispered to him an invaluable phrase I've learned in the rooms. What anyone else thinks of us is none of our business. He nodded in agreement and took his girlfriend's hand. We sat listening to the eulogies, the words about this woman whose life had touched mine so differently than others in the room. I detached, I let go, and I allowed myself to be in awe that this incredible structure we were sitting in had lasted so many years through so many funerals in such a wildly different neighborhood. The service ended. We traipsed in our funeral procession to the cemetery where cousins came up to my car, touching at me and commenting at me like I was some near extinct bird, remarking on everything vaguely related to me, including the rental car, which was clearly labeled Hertz. Walking the lumpy grass in my heels to the burial site, one of the old lady relatives pulls me aside to headstones a few rows on the left. Look, this is your grandfather and grandmother, your Bubby and Zadie. They're right here. You should have brought flowers. <laughs> right, right. I should have done a lot of things differently, but I didn't. I didn't do it your way. Still not doing it your way. Another older female cousin proceeded to bombard me with questions about my weight as the rabbi was reciting the mourner's Kaddish. I held my lips tight, nodded, and said, let's pick this up a little later. I moved away from them, huddled under the canopy, out into the humidity and the sunshine in my black dress, sweating profusely, and feeling totally nauseous. 
I was perhaps the most silent person there, as everyone was rumoring and twittering and half-heartedly reciting this incredibly holy prayer. I personally forgot the words a long time ago, so the best I could do was just remain silent. That's another treasure from Al-Anon. Enjoy the silence. After my initial shock of being in the rooms, my first three or four years, I finally, finally felt like speaking up. I eventually had something to offer at the group level. It wasn't very profound, but I could share something more than just crying and complaining. I'd been listening long enough that I had the courage to speak and share some of my experience. Somehow, learning to be quiet and not have to fill in that void in a meeting where no one raises their hand to speak helped me let go of my need to be seen. In a noisy, addicted family, it was so easy to get loud and even easier to keep escalating the noise until it was all just shouting. But being silent, being careful with my words, and in control of my emotions was risky. It meant not being noticed, not being in the center, trying to control everyone else's emotions and interactions. Removing my voice from the pile allowed space. And in the space, my understanding and strength grew. I, I didn't get that before, that I could be quiet until I actually had something to say. Filling in the holes of my life with noise had not worked as uh, I, so I was learning something new, still learning it apparently as I bit my lip and put my sunglasses on, hoping that the heat wouldn't make my eyeliner melt. Otherwise, I'd have another exposed piece of myself to defend. The grade side service ended and people came to hug each other. Do you know even the hugs were terrible? I have become so spoiled by this program, giving and receiving hugs, real hugs, even from strangers after a meeting, smiles, genuine appreciation, and people pumping compassion and kindness with each other. To be faced with this incredible falseness, this utter lack of empathy and nice, made my heels sink into the grass as I studied myself for false tears, over-emotionality, caustic commentary, and one-armed hugs. <sighs> I quickly shuffled to the safety of my car, turning it on, blasting the air conditioning, waiting, waiting for relief, and for the funeral procession to move so we could proceed to my cousin's house. Waiting in the line, I picked up my phone and I looked down. A few text messages blinked silently at me from a few program friends and lovers, people who were working on living in the now. One in particular made me chuckle with its poignancy. Did you eat yet? <laughs> right. Like eating in front of these vultures was without them scrutinizing me? Are you kidding me? No. Turns out what she is referring to, though, is one of my favorite Al-Anon slogans. Halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, with the silent H at the end just for women. Hormonal. <laughs> no, in fact, I had not eaten. Um, I did need to eat before the real onslaught. So I rummaged in my overnight bag and found a deformed Luna bar, demolished it in under a minute, and as I was chewing the last chomp, the cars began moving. The air conditioning started working, and I was able to proceed, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, to the house. The ultimate in you are not like us exercise. A massive construction in the Philadelphia suburbs, spacious, conspicuous, well-appointed, carefully designed with a backyard bigger than half of my apartment building in Oakland. Yes, this is not my life. And that's okay, because I don't want this life. Al-Anon at first gave me a shield, but then it gave me a platform to square Stanley on. 
I do not need to compare my insides to their outsides anymore, and definitely not here with these people. The door opened, and the interrogations began. Every imaginable question and offensive comment was hurled at me, my brother and his girlfriend, who coincidentally or not looks incredibly similar to his ex-wife. She was called the ex-wife's name over and over. Others commented on how good I look now that I've lost weight. And are you really gay or is this just a phase? I, I thought you were married. Was, was you married to a man or to a woman? He was trans. Uh, every possible scenario I'd envisioned was happening. And the best part, I hardly said anything. The only responsibility I had that day in that house was to take care of myself. I excused myself after literally being cornered by a flock of female relatives and hurried to the bathroom. If they hook me emotionally, I will get dragged along behind them. I have tools. I have a deep reservoir of recovery. This experience can go exactly as I want it to. None of these folks could take my serenity unless I let them. I didn't. I'm a little competitive like that. I don't like losing. So I rejoined the party and smiled. In How Al-Anon Works, it reads, we do this by practicing the 12 steps and giving comfort to families. Huh. So that was my mission after the bathroom break. Give comfort. I didn't have to take offense, give up my serenity, inform, revise, correct, get into it, or discuss anything that I didn't want to. I have control over nothing but myself and my speech. I rejoined the gathering with, um, and chose people with whom I really wanted to reconnect with. These were faces of folks I hadn't seen in years, and I wanted to learn about their lives since we'd last seen each other. I was in control of myself and my trajectory at this gathering because I didn't allow those toxic folks access to me. One tried to interrupt me, and I said with a smile, can we find time to catch up later? I'm really excited to speak with Cousin It here. It's been a long time since we've last seen each other. And then turning from her, I returned my attention because, to my cousin. Al-Anon again reminded me that I can choose my comfort, my own and others, without sacrificing my serenity. Emotional comfort is just as important as physical comfort. And that's one of the core lessons I've learned and keep learning in my recovery. How to keep yourself safe, even in the lion's den? Al-Anon. This is not about memorizing and regurgitating a principle or a step or even a passage from a book. It's about the promise I learned 11 years ago. We will intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle us. I didn't learn how to do this by just saying those phrases over and over. I had to learn the steps and live them to be able to practice these principles in all of my affairs. And how incredibly satisfying and self-esteem boosting to be able to trust myself and my spiritual path in that situation. I was fully present in that moment, responding to this cousin who is perhaps one of my most activating qualifiers. Standing, smiling, beaming kindness, and genuine happiness. My world is no longer a house of cards that can be obliterated by an alcoholic wind. I know this because two weeks after Gloria's funeral, my mom's addicted 40-year estranged sister committed suicide. I learned that I could simply allow the news to wash over me and not be pulled down into that emotional undertow. 
The rooms of my mind do not change, no matter the lengths I go to rearrange the furniture of dusty memories. My hindsight is fickle and obscures like Vaseline on the lens, making it hazy. It couldn't really have been that bad, but it was. I am still that frightened little girl telling stories in the dark, but the dreams I'm dreaming now bring me forward and allow me to look back at her with kindness and gratitude. Without her fear, I wouldn't be here today giving back to you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.